that you're planning Can I give you this, Mr. Blaketon? You know I'm always on the lookout for new stories. Running a busy pub like this, you must hear of quite a few goings on. Perhaps you could let me know any juicy ones. What makes you think I'll do that, Mr. Downing? Because I pay for good tip-offs. I'll make it worth your while, OK? He's a nasty piece of work. He'll be getting no tip-offs out of me. Nor me. I what he did to Bernie a few weeks ago. Uh, 20 pound drive, please. So, Constable, what's happening in the great big wicked world of Aidan's Field? Very little, I hope. Of a criminal nature, anyway. That's the spirit. Never let a crime come between you and your next cup of tea. Right! Anybody even had time to do it. I couldn't have been aware for two minutes, boss. Don't suppose you saw anything, officer? Uh, no, sir. Well, don't just stand there, man. Start asking around to see if anybody else did. All I want is you will. So, darling, I'm counting on you. Tell me that it isn't true. Well, nobody over there saw anybody messing about with the car. Take me home, Briscoe. Right, Sir I shall, of course, expect a full investigation of this matter, officer. Right, sir. Thanks, Gina. Thanks, Peg. Tra. Of course, you know who that is, don't you? Should I? That is Sir Richard Lonsdale, QC, known to the tabloid as the Tiger of the Old Bailey. Recently retired, and he and his wife have moved back to Weatherdale Hall. Really? I'd better see if anyone here saw anything, then. Yeah, good idea. Hello, David. What have you got there, then? Oh, it's the uh, new radio. Mm. Actually, I, I just got the jumble sailed out of the church hall. It's a bit battered. Well, it works, though. Go on, then. Switch it on. <laughs> I reckon you got yourself a bit of a bargain there, David. Yeah, I like a bit of radio myself, for a change. Morning story. And, of course, everything on the third programme. What other stations can you get? Oh. Where are you, Rob? Over. Just leaving the Edensfield Arms. I wanted to report an incident. Over. Go ahead. Over. Seems someone vandalised a vehicle parked outside. Took a nasty scratch out of the paintwork. No, no, I, 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 I
the police. Sir Richard Lonsdale. Well, yeah, they're just outside. I'll better change the station. Not sure. Oh, don't be daft. Come back. It's got to be illegal listening to the police. But they don't know we are, do they? Well, what if they find out? Well, I can be. It still seems a bit risky to me, though, Peg. But then it's only by taking risks that the great fortunes of the world are made, Rosie. I can't see how eavesdropping on police broadcasts is going to make anybody's fortune. But then that's because you aren't blessed with my imagination, isn't it, lovey? My gift for literal thinking. Here. So, did you report it to the police? A member of the local plod promised to make a few inquiries. I'm not holding my breath. In my experience, they're worse than useless, these country coppers. So touching, though, Richard, your faith in your fellow human beings. Well, you'll still be wanting to go for your usual ride, Sir Richard. Of course. But first, I must make a phone call. I'm free. I was just admiring the house. Only you do realise this is private property, don't you? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I didn't. Some house, eh? You want a word, Sarge? I do, yes. I've just had the Deputy Chief Constable on about you. He's had a Sir Richard Lonsdale on. Wanted to know the progress you've been making in investigating the vandalising of his Bentley. Well, none so far, Sarge. But you've asked around, presumably? Yes, Sarge. Nobody saw anything. Then ask harder, would you? It seems that Sir Richard has powerful friends at court. Yes, Sarge. Find a bitter, please. Hello again. Oh, hold on. Can I get you one? Yeah, go on then, yeah, I'll have enough with you. And a half, please, landlord. You see, David, newspapers pay for tip-offs. And the way I see it, if we keep tuned into that police wave band, well, we're bound to find some things that they'll be interested in. So tomorrow, me and you are going to pay a visit to the Gazette officers. Oh, do I really have to come on, Peggy? Well, it's just I'm not very good at that sort of thing. We're only going to find out whether they pay or not. You don't have to say a word. Just listen and learn. Somebody had a go at your gaffer's Bentley, I heard. Yeah, that's right, yeah. What is it about Bentley that brings out the worst in people, eh? So what's he like to work for? Oh, he's not a bad look at all, really. Yeah, as long as everything's done just right. Oh, yeah. He's a stickler, you see, for routine. He gets up at exactly the same time every day, and his breakfast has to be on the table <laughs> waiting for him. Yeah, he has to be brought down here for one large malt at exactly 12 o'clock. And when he gets home, he wants his horse ready within five minutes for his daily ride. Always the same route and over exactly the same distance. Really? I'm free. I'm free. And I'm waiting for you.
still breathing. I'll get a doctor. Rob, we've had a report of a riding accident at Weatherdale Hall. Sounds like your friend Sir Richard. Over. Has Helen been alerted? Over. She alerted us. Over. OK, on my way. Out. Well, David, it looks like we're in business. <laughs> Stay right where you are, Sir Richard, until the ambulance arrives. Should be here any moment. How was he? Well, there's no loss of sensation, but I'll have to get him checked back at the hospital. So he must have been thrown then. Oh, hardly. the editor of this paper, Mr... Uh, Pulver. Mr Pulver. Good. Well, now, me and my nephew may be able to offer you a service. Very interesting. Now, as I understand it, you pay for tip-offs, right? As long as they turn out to be reliable. No problem on that score. And can I ask you how you obtained this information? Oh, come on now. You, of all people, must realise that we journalists have to protect our sources. Excuse me a minute. Fred, follow this up, will you? So, how much do you pay? What are those two doing here? Attempted murder. If that rope had caught him full in the throat, it would definitely have broken his neck. I presume he's been taken to hospital? Yeah. You best get yourself over there. I'm tired. I really think you ought to have stayed in overnight, Richard. They obviously thought you should have done. If only for observation. Face one of their poisonous hospital breakfasts. Oh, thank you. Round and round we go. We take it fast and slow. Sir Richard! Sir Richard! Uh, Someone got it in for you. Where did the rope hit? Go to the devil. We just want the All truth. Right. You heard what he said. Now get on. Go on. Can I have a word, please, sir? Well, in fact, I want a word with you. So, have you any idea who might have strung that rope across? An old enemy of yours, perhaps? British jails are full of old enemies of mine. What interests me more, though, is how on earth the press got hold of it so quickly. It could only have come from you people. I think that's pretty unlikely, actually, sir. Who the hell else would they have got it from? They had chapter and verse, Constable. They obviously also knew all about the rope. The very last thing a retired QC of my eminence needs is that kind of publicity. I realise how you must feel, sir, but the press can be pretty bolshy about being told what they can and cannot publish. We'll see about that. Now, if you excuse me, I'm going to lie down. I don't suppose you have any idea who might have pulled a stunt like that, Lady Lonsdale? I'm afraid I haven't, Constable. Though, as Richard says, he has accumulated his fair share of enemies over the years. You're Sir Richard's regular chauffeur, right? A yeah, chauffeur, odd job man. You name it, I'll do it. I don't suppose you've seen anyone hanging around the place past few days, have you? Yeah, it's funny you should mention that. There was a bloke looking at the house only yesterday. 
And when I bumped into him down the Edensfield Arms last night, you were quizzing me about Sir Richard. Do you know his name? No, I've never seen him before. What did he look like? Uh, six foot, short hair, thirties, sort of lived in face, you know. And you've no idea where he lives? No. Right, well, if you bump into him again, you'll let me know, right? Yeah, I'll do that, yeah. Police station. He is, sir. Yes, just a moment. Deputy Chief Constable. Now what? Yes, sir. Well, there's no way they were tipped off from here. Although we did have a reporter call in about it. Yes, of course. I'll phone the editor right away. Yes, sir. This Sir Richard Lonsdale QC is beginning to get right up my nose. You didn't field any questions from the press about this, did you, Younger? No, Sergeant. Well, maybe somebody from the hospital tipped them off. Well, they were damn quick if they did. Anyway, get me the editor of the Gazette on the line, would you? Much good, mate, do me. Right, Sarge. Oh, Younger. Put the kettle on. Yes, yes, of course. I understand. Any joy, Sergeant? They put the paper to bed half an hour ago, which is going to make me very popular down at Division. Briscoe tells me they've just collected the bank to have that scratch repaired. So I'm going to have to borrow your car for a couple of days. Do you need it now? Yes, I thought I'd go down to the club. Have a leisurely steam. Well, you won't find it very comfortable with that collar on. I expect I'll manage. Thank you. All right, Briscoe. Down to the club. In her ladyship's car. Right. He talked too much, she laughed too loud. You see her face, moving proud. That's the price of love, the price of love. The debt you pay, tears and pain. The price of love, the price of love. It costs you more. making sure that nobody fiddles with this and we end up losing the police wavelength. Well, well what happens if you want to listen to Morning Story or, or the third programme? Life's about priorities. And at present, our first priority is making a bob or two. But... So will you be needing me at all tonight? No, I don't think so. See you tomorrow. Hello, Dickie. Long time no see. What the 
hell are you doing here? It's not very polite. I can remember a time when you was a bit friendlier. Those were the days, though, eh, back in swing in London. I have to tell you, I was delighted when I saw you in that Bentley yesterday. How nice for you that you'd retired to the country while I was still inside. If you knew the trouble I went to to try and track you down. Still worth it in the end, I dare say. Get off my land, or I'll have someone throw you off. No, no, you wouldn't want to make a scene. Incidentally, that's a very nice country club you're a member of these days. The car stairs. I considered joining myself, but when I saw what they charged for membership, way out of my league, I'm afraid. Mind you, I did wonder what they might think if they knew what some of their members got up to. Or what Lady Lonsdale might think, for that matter. I strongly advise you, Morton, to stay well away from my wife. What is it you want, anyway? Money, I suppose. You usually did. Well, since you mention it, times are hard. You stitch me up and you owe me. You do realise I could call the police? <laughs> you can't do that, though, can you? After all, what might come out in court if they put me in the dock? See, I couldn't say too much last time, not without getting myself into even more serious trouble. But now, what have I got to lose? I've done my time, thanks to you. All right. How much? Should we say two thou to be going on with? I don't have that kind of money in the house. It's all right, you can drop it off at my cottage tomorrow. It's on Langham Lane on the edge of the village. It's called Honey Cottage. Isn't that sweet? talking about? Well, to take it in turns to listen in. So I'll take the first watch and then later on you can take the second. Oh, hey, do you think we really ought to be doing this? Old Chinese proverb, David Love. Never look gift horse in mouth. Besides, don't you find it exciting? Not really, no. And what's the address of this cottage, sir? Yeah, I know that. But if you wouldn't mind waiting there for me, I'll be five minutes. Yes, David. Uh, actually, I, I just wanted to ask you something, Mr. Blaketon. All right. Right. Say you had this friend who had this radio, right? And and he, he discovered that you could pick up police broadcasts on it. I mean, quite by accident. Well, could could he uh, get into trouble for that? You know, just just for listening, like. Well, not just for listening. He could. So what's the score? Over? Has to be murder, Sarge. He's been shot in the chest. Over. So when do you reckon it might have happened? Over? Well, there's a half-eaten dinner on the table, so I'd say last night. Over. Sorry. 
saw you down at the Gazette office, right? So? So can I buy you a drink? Uh, no, thanks. I'm very particular about who I drink with. I'll tell you something else for free. Me and my Aunt Peggy are going to put you out of business. Oh, are you? Yeah. Because we've got this radio that picks up police broadcasts, right? So there's nothing that goes on round here that we don't hear about first. Really? See the idea on the way. I just found this on the floor, sir. You better put it back where you found it. And look what else I found. And that's Sir Richard Lonsdale, and there's Morton. Now, if you read these cuttings, they refer to a case a few years ago when Morton got four years for beating up some bloke in a pub in London. Now, according to one of these, Sir Richard Lonsdale was prosecuting, and they reckon it was the ferocity of his summing up that gave Morton such a savage sentence. Well, that gives him a motive. Is it feasible that he set the ambush up? It seems a strong possibility, Sarge, yes. Right. Get over to Weatherdale Hall. See what Sir Richard has to say about all this. Sarge. Oh! Oh, David! David, you'll never believe what's happened. There's been a murder. I heard it on the radio. Where? In a cottage up on Langham Lane. Somebody's been shot. Hey, you're not thinking of passing that on to the papers, are you? Oh, no, no. No, passing on stuff like traffic accidents and that, that's one thing, but we don't want anything to do with any murders. It's a shame, though, really. Mm. I mean, a tip-off like that would certainly be worth a bob or two. Yes, sir. Neil Downing, freelance journalist. I know who you are, Mr. Downing. And what can we do for you, Mr. Downing? It's more a case of what I can do for you, actually, Sergeant. Oh? You do realise your police broadcasts are being monitored? Oh, yes. That's not against the law. And the information's being sold on as tip-offs to the local paper? And that is against the law? And would you happen to know who might be doing this? Does the name David Stockwell mean anything to you, Sergeant? And his famous Aunt Peggy? Mr. Briscoe. Yes, Constable. The man who was asking questions about Sir Richard the other day. I'll need you to come down to the station later on to ID a photograph of him. Why, well, has there been some further development? We had a murder last night. A murder? Is Sir Richard in? Yeah, he's around the back. In fact, that's him now, keeping down the rabbit population. Thanks. You do remember the case, then, sir? I remember all my cases, Constable. But this was years ago. We have reason to believe that it was Morton who ambushed you the other day. So have you arrested him? He was shot and killed last night. Really? Not that I'm surprised, mind you. He was always a nasty piece of work. Destined to come to a bad end. He hadn't by any chance made any attempt to contact you, had he, sir? Why on earth would he do that? Well, if he was the one who had strung that rope between the trees, there's every possibility he might have. After all, according to the cuttings we found in his cottage, you really took him to pieces in court a few years ago. I haven't seen him since I saw him being taken down, and I certainly haven't heard from him. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have things to be getting on with. Excuse me, sir. Your rifle. I'm going to have to get it over to a ballistics immediately to eliminate any match with the bullet. You're not seriously suggesting I had anything to do with the shooting of that wretched man? At this stage, I'm not suggesting anything, sir. Could you also account for your movements last night between, say, 8 o'clock and the rest of the evening? 
I most certainly can. I had dinner, I watched the news on television, then I went to bed. But don't take my word for it. My wife would be most happy to confirm it. In fact, why don't you ask her on your way out? You'll find her in the conservatory. Lady Lonsdale? Yes. Please see Walker, Ashford Lee, please. Yes, I remember. Uh, your husband tells us that he spent all last night here with you. Can you confirm that? Uh, there's obviously been some mistake, Constable. Or else his memory's playing tricks on him, which I have to say is quite unlike Richard. I, I was here, certainly, but he was out for the whole evening. In fact, it must have been well after midnight when he got back. Really? Hmm. She gone stark staring mad. That's what she tells us, sir. And she has given us a statement to that effect. I'd like to make a phone call. Of course, sir. Will that be to your solicitor? Will it? No. It'll be to my chauffeur, Briscoe. So, uh, what exactly has Miller asked you to do? About young David, I mean. Well, catch them red-handed if we can. Which I wouldn't have thought would be that difficult. Neither of them being what you might call candidates for this year's Brain of Britain. You're all in Sir Richard Lonsdale on suspicion of the murder last night, right? That's right. Well, I'm here to tell you that he couldn't have done it because he never left the house. Our information is that he was out the entire evening. Well, then your information's wrong. That information was given to us by Lady Lonsdale herself. She's mistaken. She does get confused sometimes, usually after her first couple of drinks of the morning. And how can you be so sure he was in the house? Well, two reasons. One, because I saw him in there through the window, having been in my flat all evening. And the other reason? Well, because I only went to bed myself at about two o'clock in the morning, and he certainly never asked me to drive him anywhere. Well, couldn't he have driven himself? No, he can't. Um, drive, I mean. I can't believe you're still questioning me, Sergeant. We've just had a call from ballistics confirming your rifle was the murder weapon. What? Under the circumstances, I must request that you remain here until you've had a word with CID. Take him back to the interview room, would you, younger? This way, sir. Take your hands off me, boy. Somebody's lying. Could even be Briscoe, to give his boss an alibi. Hell of a thing to do, though, in a murder case. And Sir Richard doesn't exactly strike me as being the kind of boss who'd inspire that kind of loyalty. Or me. So why is his wife lying? If she is lying? Well, at least we got the murder weapon side. To which Sir Richard had access? As did his wife, presumably. And Briscoe, since he's living on the premises. Now, it seems to me, Sarge, that the bit of the puzzle that's missing is the motive. I mean, why would any of the three of them want to kill Morton? I wonder whether we should have another look at Morton's cottage, see if we missed anything. Wouldn't do any harm, I suppose. Once I hid mountains in the palm of my hand And rivers that ran through every day They must have been made, I never knew what I had Until I threw it all away Love is all that is, it makes the world go round. Loving only love, it can't be denied. Uh -huh. No matter what you think about it, you just won't be able to do without it. Did you know Morton, Sir Richard? As far as I was concerned, he was simply another case I dealt with. But you knew him before that. Did I? Didn't you? We'd met, yes. So would you describe yourself as friends? Possibly close friends? Hardly. Only you seem quite close in this photograph we found amongst his possessions. I mean, I wouldn't have thought many people would feel free to call you Dickie, especially somebody like Morton. 
And the other thing that's baffling me is how you ended up ripping him apart in court like that, if you were so close. Unless there'd been a, a falling out between the two of you. I think, Sergeant, I should like to have my solicitor present. Of course. So come on, whose idea was it? Well, yours, I suppose. I'm sorry, I don't know what you're on about. I'm talking about this new cottage industry that you've just launched. Listening into police broadcasts and tipping off the local paper for money. I'm sorry. I'm afraid I still don't know what you're on about. Listen, Peggy, I'm trying to do you a favour. I'm laying my head on the block. I'm not doing it for your sake, but certainly for his. You've been reported. Oh, by A certain journalist who resented you muscling in on his patch. Was it Downing? Who else? Well, how did he find out? So well, my information is, is the little birdie told him. Isn't that so, David? Oh, David, you didn't. Oh, I didn't mean to. Which is after what he did to Bernie, I just... Well, he just got me going, that's all. It's my own fault, I suppose, for involving him in this in the first place. Now, listen. Tonight, there's going to be a broadcast about a big job that's coming up. Only there isn't a job. It's been set up to catch you two red-handed. So whatever you hear on the radio, don't go anywhere near it, or Miller will have you. Why did you tell us your husband was out Tuesday night? According to Briscoe, you were both in all evening. Well, how would Briscoe know? He wasn't here. Wasn't he? No, he was out the entire evening. Must have been the small hours before he got back. I heard the car driving up. My car. He claims he was in all evening. Well, his word against mine. Have you ever seen this before? No, I can't say that I have. It was found in the cottage where Morton was shot. Was it really? Do many people call your husband Dicky? <laughs> I can't think of anyone who dare. Does it surprise you then to see it written on this photo? It would have done before yesterday, when Morton called round to see my husband, and I caught the gist of their conversation, and realised from that that they were old friends. Well, <laughs> rather more than old friends. You never realised until then? Well, I had an idea that Richard had some sort of double life, but I never knew just what it was he got up to. <sighs> the amazing thing was how brazen he was when I challenged him about it. He told me the whole story. How Morton had picked a fight with the new lover Richard had found. Oh, someone younger, of course and prettier, presumably, <laughs> beat him within an inch of his life. And Richard got his revenge by representing the other boy in court, giving one of his legendary performances, which resulted in Morton being given a quite savage sentence. So was your husband here Tuesday night, or wasn't he? Yes, Constable, he was here. Then why did you tell us he wasn't? I suppose I was taking my revenge. After all, it isn't every day that a wife finds out that for the last 20 years of her marriage, all she's been providing is cover for her husband's real sexual proclivities. All right, Younger, there's your script. Precisely six o'clock, you make your first announcement. Bellamy, you got the address? Yes, sir. Be there in good time. Will I get into trouble for lying to you? Under the circumstances, I'll see what I can do, but we'll have to see what Sergeant Miller says. Has Briscoe worked for you long? Not long, no. Attention all units. Target is confirmed as Damson's Factory, Monument Road. All units start to move into position. That's it, David. The dummy broadcast. Right, now, you're not thinking of trying to sell that, are you? What I'm thinking, David, is if there's one thing I can't stand, it's being bested by the likes of Downing. And what's more, I've just had a very malicious idea concerning that gentleman. 
Well, what are you going to do? You said that on the night of the murder you were here all evening. Yeah, that's right, yeah. According to Lady Lonsdale, you were out all evening and didn't get back to the early hours. Well, she's obviously lying again. Or been hitting the bottle even harder than usual. Then there's the question of the fingerprints. What fingerprints? On the stock of the rifle. Which rifle? Sir Richard's. You see, we were expecting to find his dabs on it, but the others, well, they're a bit more puzzling. So I'd like to ask you to come to the station and give me a set of yours. Right. Um, I'll get my jacket. Here we go. What's that phrase? Low down and dirty. Only, when I'm doing this, I want you to go and get the drinks in. Preferably next to our friend, Mr Downing. Clothes of sand covered your face Given you meaning, taken my place so make your way on down to the sea. Something has taken you so far from me. You're going somewhere. David! David! You'll never guess what I've just heard coming over the police wave band. Apparently, there's this big police operation going on up at Damson's factory. Some international gang, they reckon, and the police are there now, waiting for them. <laughs> Why did you do a runner, Mr Briscoe? Well, I was scared, wasn't I? I know what you coppers are like when you get us inside the nick. You've had experience of that before, have you? You weren't, perhaps, worried about the fingerprints on the rifle matching up with yours? Well, were you? I weren't you. Why did you shoot him, Mr Briscoe? Did Sir Richard put you up to it? No, he had nothing to do with it. Look, that little Toba blackmail on him, right? Threatening to ruin him. I couldn't just stand by and let him do that. Not when I saw how it were affecting Sir Richard. It hurt me to see how upset he was. It means the world to me. Look, I didn't mean to kill Morton. I just meant to scare him off, you know. But then I saw him standing there, and the next thing I just... But Sir Richard knew nothing about any of this. I did it for him, but it were all my own idea, you know. It was just to scare him off. <laughs> Mr. Downing. Fancy meeting you here. I was passing. Saw your car. Wondered what was going on. Seems to be a very peculiar sound coming from your boot. Do you know? That sounds like a police broadcast. I repeat, the foxes are approaching the coop. I never saw that before in my life. That's what they all say, isn't it, Mr. Downing? So, can I see him? As you're a material witness in the case, I'm afraid not, sir. Walker? I could have sworn that the forensic report said that the rifle was clean of fingerprints. Really, Sarge? Nice. Good job Briscoe doesn't get a copy of that report, then. There you go. I'll get these. Out of your real gotten gains, I suppose. Now then, Oscar. So, who are we drinking to? Well, how about Mr Downing? <laughs> <laughs> Now then, David, tomorrow me and you are going to do a bit of shopping. 
Not really, what for? To get you a new radio, of course. Ah! Good morning, everyone. Gordon? What are you doing here? We're getting ready for my morning surgery. Miss Swinging Elsin, babe, win a flat on Marine Drive and dinner at Giovanni's for six months. You're not. <laughs> Money for old rope. All you got to do is walk up and down in a bikini. Ah, the lovely nurse Dean. Hello, Mr Rose. Age shall not be the her, nor custom stale her infinite variety. Thank you, nurse. Now, you'll be so much more comfortable in a minute. I'm under strict instructions from Dr. Wetherill not to let you overdo it. And I repeat, my wife is not my GP. What seems to be the problem? And now, a big hand for our final contestant. All this. Number 10, Miss Lizzie Hopkirk. Our well, Lizzie's got healing hands. A trained typist. She works as a receptionist at our very own St. Aidan's Hospital. <laughs> loser there's always one she can't be miss elsenby she's not a miss anymore she got divorced this week but i only had the one husband you've been through every fella in elsenby oh! Oh! Oh!